Okay, now we've been studying the book of Hosea, and uh, I promised I was going to finish the book of Hosea. But last week I gave you an assignment to read with Genesis chapter 25 through 35, and I said it would be easy because you only need to read two chapters a day. <laughs> And I know some of the names are very hard to pronounce. Well, we might not get to go through all of those names because uh, I want to leave on a very good positive note today. My wife says there's so much going on in the world today and there's so much things to get depressed about that I should leave you with a happy thought. Sure. Right? Always. Always. <laughs> and if my wife wants it, she better get it. Okay. Yeah. So, but... If you want to follow along, I'm just going to briefly go through some of the things that we had already talked about. And you know in chapters 1, 2, and 3 that God is talking to Hosea, who was a prophet to the northern kingdom, that's the ten tribes that broke away from uh, the southern kingdom of Judah. And, and that was prophesied and the Lord wanted that to happen but here in uh, chapter 12 and verse 2 of Hosea it says the Lord has a controversy with Judah as well as with the northern kingdom and he says and he will punish Jacob according to his ways according to his doings Will he recompense him? And now, if you know the story of Jacob, Jacob fits in here, and he's using Jacob as an illustration when we get over to chapter uh, 13. Now, Jacob was the son of Isaac and Rebekah. And you know, Abraham was called and then the, God blessed him and said he's going to bless the whole world through him and through his seed. And his seed was Isaac. And he made the same promise to Isaac that through his seed it was going to be blessed. Well, Isaac didn't get married until he was 40 years old. And it's hard to realize sometimes, but he was married for 20 years and he didn't have any children. Abraham was 100 years old when he had, you know, Isaac. And so, and God promised that he was going to be the progenitor of many nations. And then, you know, Sarah laughed. <laughs> she said, you mean to tell me Abraham's going to have pleasure at his old age? He's 100 years old and he's going to have kids? Well, he had one. And then they lived on. And even after, you know, Sarah, she died, that Abraham remarried. And he had about 10 kids from that other wife. And he was 185 years old when he died. Oh, my Lord, my goodness. And, you know, and so the thing, you know, <laughs> I'm not even halfway there yet. But the thing is, that when he had Isaac, you know, and Isaac was 40 when he got married. Now, that's unthinkable for some people. They say, man, I lived the life for so long, I'm stuck in my ways. Well, he got married, and for 20 years, they couldn't have a child. So then, that's when Isaac, you know, prayed to the Lord. And when he prayed to the Lord and made intercession for his wife, that then she was able to bear children. And the stream goes through. And so when she was having the pregnancy, it was a very hard pregnancy, you know. So she said, why am I like this? You know, I'm having such pain and such difficulty. And the Lord spoke to her and said, there are two nations in your womb. <laughs> and she said, oh, that explains it. <laughs> you know, how, how many people is that? <laughs> you know, two nations. And she said, but... There are two nations and two people are in there and they're striving for superiority. 
He says, and the thing is that the older one will serve the younger one. You know, and that seemed kind of strange because that way before the law was given, way before anything was thought, but in those days, the firstborn received a double blessing or a double portion of everything that the father had. Okay? And in the case of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, that double portion included certain responsibilities and certain privileges that they would not only have a double portion of the wealth of the land of the animals, but also they would be the priest of the family. When the father died, the oldest son would take over as the priest of the whole tribe. And when he died, his oldest son would take over. And so when he said that the older is going to serve the younger, it seemed strange. But then through the course of time, when it was older, that Abraham was thought he was going to die, but he still lived a couple of years after. He was 185. Well, before he died, he told Esau, go out and get some of that venison that I love so much and bring it back and make a soup and then I will bless you. You're the oldest son. I will bless you. Well, Abraham either forgot or he deliberately did it that that it said the older is supposed to serve the younger. And Rebecca, you know, heard that what the father had said to Esau, and she said to Jacob, you know, now the thing is that when you think of the names, they mean something. Esau meant red and hairy. And so they called him Esau because he was a wild man. They said he's going to be a man of the outdoors. He's rugged. He's going to climb the mountains. He's going to shoot the bows and arrows. He's going to do everything a boy would do. But Jacob is a mama's boy. He's smooth skinned. He's gentle, you know, but he's a manipulator. That's what he said when they came out of the womb. It said that Jacob had a hold of Esau's heel. And so it said that he wanted to come out first. It's implied that he wanted to come out first. He's a conniver. So when he steals, you know, the birthright, so he goes real fast and his mother is in on the plan. Go get one of the goats and I'll make it like the venison. Hurry before your brother gets back. Now, we don't know how long he was out there, you know. Well, anyway, he comes back and he's exhausted and uh, he says, give me some of that pottage, you know, and he says, I'm about to die. And so Jacob says, give me your birthright. And he says, are you crazy? What good is the birthright going to do me? I'm about to die, you know. And so that's one reason why God said that the older is going to serve the younger because he didn't care anything about spiritual things. He didn't care about the authority. He just wanted to do his own thing. But Jacob, he manipulated to get the birthright. And when then his brother was out hunting again, that, you know, Rebecca said, go get a goat and we'll make that venison. And he said, my, he said, I can't do that. Suppose... He finds out it's me because by this time he's blind. You know that uh, Abraham is blind. So she says, I'll take the goat skin and put it on your hands and put it on your neck and everything. And so then she makes it all up and he goes in and says, Dad, here's that pottage that you wanted. And he says, who are you? He said, I'm Esau. He says, it sounds like Jacob. He said, come here and let me feel you. And he went over and he felt his hands because his mother made it feel out of the goat skin and felt rough. He said, it feels like Esau, but it sounds like Jacob. And so he said, come here and kiss me. So he took him by the neck and he, his mother was wise enough to put stuff on the neck. And he says, 
Yes, and she even had Esau's clothes put on him. So here's the mother deceiving the father for the younger son. And so you had a father with one boy and a mother with another boy. And, you know, that doesn't make for a good arrangement. But still, God said he chose them not because they were good. They chose them because he believed that God existed. You know, so then after Esau comes back in, well, the father blesses Jacob and he says, all of your brothers and sisters that are going to bow down to you, you're going to have all the authority in the family. You've got all of the rights and everything. The land is going to provide for you. And the blessings always came true what the adult said to that person. And when Esau goes back and finds out that he was tricked and his brother got the blessing, and the father said, oh, when he found out that he was duped, and he found out that he'd given the blessing to Jacob and not to Esau, then he trembled. He trembled because I don't know why, but possibly he realized that he had given it to the wrong person, and he had disobeyed God, but he was manipulated in doing what was supposed to be happening anyway. And so then Jacob, over, or the mother overheard Esau say that when my father dies, that I'm going to kill my brother. And so the mother heard that and she said, you know, your brother's going to kill you as soon as the days of mourning for your father is over. She said, go to my brother, which is, you know, a couple hundred miles away. And so he decides he's running for his life. And he goes up to this place, and it's about a day's journey, and he's going to sleep there. And so he finds a rock, puts it there for his head. And then he has this dream of this ladder with the angels going up and down and up and down. And then he woke up. Am I dreaming or am I not dreaming? And then he heard the voice of God say that, you know, Jacob. And he said, I will, this is the God of your fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And I will be with you where you go and I will prosper you. You know, and he thought, man, when he woke up. This is the house of God, and I didn't even know it. God is in this place. See, in those days, this nation had a God, and that nation had a God, and this nation had a God, and they were all stationary in one place, you know. So here, he said, this is God's house. So that's where he said he raised up an altar, and he put it there. And when he get, finally gets up to Laban, who is his mother's brother, then he falls in love with the daughter who is Rachel, you know, and boy, so he decides, I'll work for you and for seven years, you know, for Rachel. He said, okay. So he worked for him for seven years, and when it's time for the wedding to come, you know, it's the night time and harvest time, and they're all saying, well, let me get a big group together, get them together. They were all out there carrying on, drinking and all of this. And here, Leah, the older one, had a mask over, not a mask, but a veil. And so she was already in the tent. And he goes in, and he didn't know until morning that he'd been duped by layman, you know. And so he got up, and he said, what are you doing? You deceived me. And he said, oh, you know, it's not right for the younger one to be married before the firstborn. You know, and it's like... God is telling Jacob, hey, you tricked your brother out of the birthright. And now <laughs> you're being duped. And so then he said, I'll serve another seven years. And then, But to make the whole story short, he served another seven years for Rebekah. And then he said, Laban said, you know, that uh, I noticed that I've prospered and God is with you. For some reason. So why don't you stay with me for a while? And so he tricked Laban. So he said, okay. Certain of the animals, the cows and the sheep, I will set aside for me the ring stripe, the brown, the stripe, whatever. And the other ones are you. And so he 
figured out a way to manipulate them so that the strong animals mated with his animals and he would became rich. And so then Laban's sons said, you know, Jacob over here is getting rich off of our father. And they were starting to have a little bit of friction. And then Jacob was saying, yeah, you know, that Laban doesn't seem to really have the same feelings toward me as he used to. So the Lord told him to go back to Bethel. So he goes back to Bethel, but he's on his way. You know, here's Laban. He got a bunch of men. He's going to go back and he's going to give Jacob a thing or two. So he goes after him. And one night, it was a three-day journey. So one of the nights, God spoke to Laban. And he said, don't you touch Jacob. He is my servant. So then when Laban got there, he said, not only did you take my daughters and my sons, my children, you also took my gods. See, because Rebecca, she stole the idols of her father and put them in. And she even lied to her father when he came searching for him. She was sitting on the camel's furniture and they were in there. And she said, oh, I can't get up. I'm the way of the woman, you know. And so the father was wroth. And so they made a... Uh, altar there of stone and in the Bible it says that Laban was mad and he told Jacob he says look we're going to have this but don't you ever come back on this side or you've had it and I'm not going to come on that side to you and that's where he said may the Lord watch between me and thee when we're absent one from another sometimes we think that's you know like I'm blessing you and blessing you. he says you scoundrel don't you come back on this side or I'm going to get you. And so here, then Jacob says, as soon as he's finished with that problem, then over here comes this other problem that he's going to go back and he says, now how am I going to appease Esau? But remember, it's been 20 years. He had seven years for one wife, seven years for another wife, and six years for the cattle and stuff, 20 years. He said, surely he would have forgotten and so he's going back and somebody comes up and says, Jacob, Esau's coming and he's got 400 armed men. You know, and Jacob, oh Lord. You know. So he says, okay, what can I do to appease him? So he breaks up some of the people, sets them forward, lets them go with some animals and things. And if Esau says anything, say, it's a gift for you. God has blessed me. And he said, oh, that's the first wave. Then the second wave, he said, oh, he takes some other children, some other servants, and some sheep. And he did this in droves. And he said, now if Esau comes and says, what is it? Say, these are a gift from my master to you. You know, and so then even his wives, <laughs> he sent his wives on the other side of the river. And he stayed on this side of the river, and that's where he, he had made this altar to God. And so he laid down there, and he trying to sleep. And all of a sudden, he was wrestling with someone. It says an angel, but it was really Jesus in a theophany. Jesus in human form before he was incarnated, because back then the angels and Jesus could appear and disappear. And so he wrestled with his angel. It was called the angel of the Lord. And when you read it in Genesis, it says you feel that he wrestled with the Lord and he had power over the angel. But he really didn't have power the way you would think he had power. Because when you get to Hosea, it says, he wrestled with the Lord and he prevailed. He only prevailed because he started crying and weeping and clinging to. It's like sometimes you have a problem, a real difficult problem. And you say, oh Lord, what am I going to do? And I'm awake all night trying to think of these problems. You know, and I know whenever I was working as a teacher and I got a call from Moody and they wanted me to go there. 
and they wanted me to half the salary. And I said, well, I really would love that job. If I was single, I would take it, you know. And I thought, oh, Lord, should I take it? Shouldn't I take it? And I went and asked my father-in-law who was a missionary. And he said, well, you'll have to pray about it. I've been praying about it. Well, anyway, when I finally made the decision to go, I thought, oh, I get a call that I, I had a car finance for a teacher union. I had to pay that off or they're going to confiscate my car. And then the buyer for my house fell through and I had two houses to pay for. I said, God, don't you know what you're doing? And he said, trust me, trust me. You know, and it's hard, you know. So I eventually got a call from a real estate man. He said, you know, I sold your house for $2,000 more than you were asking for it. I said, who is a jerk that would spend $2,000 more than you want? He said, he wanted your house so bad, he put the money down, and I don't usually do this. I'm sending it to you so you can do whatever. And I said, oh, thank you, Lord. I paid off my car, and I had money for the down payment on my house. You know, and it was just like God said, trust me, trust me in all of your afflictions. Well, let's look here in the scriptures now. Here in uh, verse 3 of chapter 12, it says, He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. How did he prevail? He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel. There he spake with us. Even the Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. He said, that's how he really prevailed, is he stopped struggling. And then, a little bit later on, as you read that, in Genesis, it says that uh, Jacob, you know, he had lied to his father about the birthright when he brought in that pottage. He said, who are you? He said, I'm Esau. I'm Esau. And then he said, uh, his father said, well, how did you find this stuff so quickly? And he said, the Lord your God gave it to me. You know, and so here he lied to his father and he also lied about to God gave it to me. You know, he was a scoundrel. And what they're trying to get across here is Jacob finally came to his senses. Well, when he was wrestling with the angel, the angel touched the inside of his thigh here and put it out of the joint and so you know he used to be able to run and he would get away and and he was crippled when he goes finally going down a road like this and i can imagine his wife saying jacob what happened to you and he says don't call me jacob i said why he says when i was wrestling with the angel and he touched me and he asked me what my name was. And I said, Jacob, a conniver, a thief, a liar. You know, and he says, but he told me, you will no longer be called Jacob. You will be called Israel. Mm -hmm. Jacob meant you're a scoundrel. You're a cheat. Israel means governed by God. Mm -hmm. And he said, now you're going to be governed by God. And so... Here, through his life, he's governed by God. And that's what Hosea is saying to the people here. He said, don't call your name Israel because Israel was representative of the ten tribes. But when they split, Israel was considered the ten tribes to the north, two tribes to the south, Judah and Benjamin, were called Judah. And so now they're up here and... You know the story of uh, Elijah. It's during this, uh, right before this time of Hosea, where Ahab was a king and Jezebel was from the northern regions and they worshiped Baal up there. And she introduced Baal worship down into the, uh, Israel. And they had 500 prophets. And remember, Elijah went up on Mount Carmel and he said it wasn't going to rain for three and a half years or whatever. And so 
The conflict was that Ahab was angry, wanted to kill him. And so finally, Elijah appears and says, I'm here. And he says, you go tell Ahab to get his priests that worship Baal up here on Mount Carmel. And there was 500 of them up there. And so they made the sacrifice. And he says, who's ever sacrificed God honors by destroying it, you know. And that's a whole other story. Well, finally, it was Ahab's. And then, after God honored uh, Elijah by taking the sacrifice and consuming it, even all the water and everything around it, then they took the prophets of Baal, 500 of them, down to the brook, and all of Israel, the northern tribes, killed all 500 prophets. And when Jezebel heard about it, she flipped out and said, I'm going to have his head this day. And all of a sudden, he's up here in Mount Hermon. He realizes that Jezebel is going to kill him. And he goes all the way down to Beersheba, which is about 300 miles away down south. And he's running from this woman just after he had victory over 500 priests. You know, and so he's gone from a high to a low. And then he's up here in the cave hiding. And God says, what are you doing up here? And he says, I was zealous for you. I did all of this for you and I did all of that for you. And I'm the only one left <coughs> that's going to kill all your prophets. And he said, I have 7,000 prophets, people who have not bowed the knee to Baal, and they have not kissed the cow. Now, I want to go through here quickly, so bear with me, okay? And look here in uh, verse 9. And I, that am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, will yet make you to dwell in tabernacles as in the days of the solemn feast. I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Then look down in verse 13. And by a prophet of the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and that was Moses, and by a prophet he was preserved because the Lord was angry with them when they were coming out of Egypt into the desert because they murmured, he was going to wipe them out. And Moses stands there and says, if you wipe them out, take me out too. And so God says, okay, but these are a hard-hearted people. And so they, they were on again, off again, on again, off again. And God said, they have a divided heart. And look here in chapter 13, verse 1. When Ephraim, referring to the whole northern kingdom, spake trembling, he exalted himself in Israel. But when he offended in Baal, he died. What he's saying is that when Ephraim trembled, meaning that he respected me and he feared me and I prospered him, he lived and he prospered. He said, but when he started worshiping Baal, he died. You know, because he didn't really die, but he meant that the whole nation was going to be wiped out. Then, look over here in verse 2. And now they have sinned more and more and have made them molten images of their silver and your idols according to their own understanding. All of it, the work of the craftsmen, and they say... Let the man that sacrifices kiss the cow. Now, this is what Hosea is trying to say. And this is what God is saying. Here is man, the most miraculous creation that he has ever made, is bowing down to a piece of silver in the shape of a cow and kissing it as his God. He says, how far can you go down? And we say, oh, could they really worship a cow? Look at the people in India. You know, the Hindus, their cows are sacred. You know, and when I was a kid, I know, and even sometimes 
<laughs> Even Jenny has one. We used to have a rabbit's foot for good luck, you know, <laughs> and thinking that if God doesn't come through, this will, or a lucky coin, or even sometimes we have crosses, you know, and kiss the cross. No, you know, in Psalms, the second Psalm, it says, kiss the sun, lest he be angry. It means don't kiss some symbol, worship him with your whole body. And so then he goes on here to say they kiss it. And, you know, a lot of times here the scripture says that Ephraim or the northern kingdom had a divided heart. Sometimes it was sacrifice to God, sometimes to Baal, you know. And it didn't matter just as long as you did it. And God's saying, return to me. Return to me. And if you don't, and so they were going up to Assyria, which is one of the wickedest nations, trying to bribe them. And they were going down to Egypt, taking oil down there, trying to bribe them. So they thought that I got to cover this way and I got to cover it that way. And God says, if I take my blessings off of you, you are going to suffer. And so, boy, I got to move on, don't I? It says, so here... Look at verse 9 of chapter 13. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is your help. I will be your king. Where is any other that can save you in all the cities? And your judges to whom you said, give me a king and princes. I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. You know, because when they came out of Egypt, they said, we want a king like other people. And God told Samuel, he said, Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They rejected me. Give them a king. And then God said, when you have a king, you're not going to have horses. Don't multiply your horses. Don't multiply your wives. Don't multiply your whatever. And here they did everything that God said not to do. So then, over here, he says, and they're all through here, there are little innuendos implying different prophecies that happen or will happen. And that's what he's saying here. And when he says, I gave you, or back here, he said, I will be your king. Because when Christ comes back in the millennium, after the tribulation, that he's going to set up his kingdom here on earth. And here this is something. He says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. And what he's saying is. Okay, you guys have sinned enough. You have rejected me. You continually reject me. And then you're going to go into captivity in the northern kingdom. And the northern kingdom, Assyria came down, took them captive. And then they were never heard from again. But then in the New Testament, he says, Paul says about Jesus, he says, Oh grave, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? You know, he said, because he has conquered that and set the prisoners free. But here, the graves that are implied is that he said he's going to take these people and scatter them throughout the whole world. And then he said, but yet I will be your king. Now, look over here in chapter 14 so I can get finished. He <laughs> says, in verse 1, O Israel! Return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words, and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, Take away our iniquity, and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. They still got the cows on their mind. And the calves of their lips mean that we are going to give you sacrifices of praise. We don't need these. See, all through Israel's history, God said, okay, now, your sacrificial systems are to point to the perfect sacrifice that's coming. 
So every year they made these sacrifices, you know, and they had to be exact. They couldn't have any blemish, no spot, anything, and they had to be perfect until the perfect sacrifice, which is Christ, came. And so they're saying, we will offer the calves of our lips because that's what God wants to do. A thank you, God, for what you did. He says, Asher will not save us. We will not ride upon horses. Now, they weren't supposed to multiply horses from way back then. But Solomon, man, he had hundreds of horses. They weren't supposed to multiply wives, but he had hundreds of concubines. And he says, We will not ride on horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, You are our gods, for in thee the fatherless thine mercy. And then he says, I will heal their backsliding. So God is saying, come back to me. This is the way you come back to me. Let me know that you're not going to do this anymore. You're not going to do that anymore. And he says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. Mine anger is turned away from him. I will be as a dew in the Israel. And he shall grow as a lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree, and his smell as Lebanon. Now, Lebanon, if you go back in history, and I'm going to stop here, but Lebanon is when David wanted to build the temple for the Lord. He had all of this cedar wood shipped in from Lebanon, and the temple on the inside was just covered with cedar wood. And if you can imagine the smell of walking into a whole building that's full of cedar and a sweet smell, you know, and so he said it would be like the smell of Lebanon and it would be beautiful like the lilies of the field. Then he goes down here and he says, they that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the wine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. And then he said, here is the key of all the whole <clears> thing. <throat> Look at verse 9. Who is wise? And he shall understand these things. Who is prudent? And he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. And the just shall walk in them. But the transgressors shall fall therein. And just a couple of verses that I wanted to go into more detail, but I didn't have time. But in the book of Romans, chapter 8, is a beautiful chapter. You ought to read it and memorize it. It says, God said, Oh, the wisdom, not the book. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. And then down here in chapter 8, 29 to 30, he says that whom he did foreknow, he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. He says, them who he predestinated, he also called. And those he called, he justified, and he also glorified. Now, I'm going to pick that up next week, but I, I want to tell you just this. That Hosea said he uses similes, you know, to get it across to the people. And not only did he use nations, but he uses people. Now, he called Abraham from way up north in the Chaldean, and Chaldean, that was Babylon. But he called Abraham, okay? So he said, whom he foreknew, he called. And then who he called, he sanctified. And then when you look that Abraham was a type of God the Father, Isaac his son was a type of Christ, because he was a perfect son, obey, obedient to the Father, all the way up to the mountain where he was going to be crucified, but he didn't know he was going to be, you know, sacrificed. But in order to be the sacrifice, he had to be sanctified. And so, here Abraham was called, he was sanctified, then you get over here, that here is 
Jacob, the scoundrel and everything, even though he was, he was justified because he believed in God. That's what justifies the person. So here it is that he was called, he was sanctified, he was justified, and Jacob had a son named Joseph. And Joseph was sold into slavery down into Egypt, and he became famous down there in Egypt. And he said, he also glorified. Okay, now, here's the closing point. It says that the whole earth, or the whole creation, groaneth and travaileth the waiting for the adoption of the sons that receive their glory. So you and I are sons and daughters of God. And it says, whenever Jesus comes and we have that glorified body, the whole earth is going to be filled with the glory. It says, it's groaning now because they want to see. And we want to see what that glorified body is going to be. What it was like before the fall. So, I wish I had another six or seven hours, but I don't. <laughs> my wife told me we gotta get out of here we gotta go we gotta go to sharing God's love and work on some food so anyway let's stand and we'll pray but I want you to know no matter what you're going through you know it says I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us when he comes back and sometimes we get so wrapped up in what we're doing and where we're going and things like that that we forget God is in control. He said, roll your burden over onto me. Okay, let's pray.